so with that, we will go on to our first information item, and that is uh, the testing for lead in drinking water program. And Dr. Swift, do you want to start us off? I believe we have also a couple folks with us this evening that um, may be on hand for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Madam President and uh, trustees and members of the community. We appreciate your presence here this evening. I appreciate uh, Dr. Dumas coming and sharing with us uh, this evening face to face and appreciated the opportunity for Mr. Marios Dimitriou, Assistant Superintendent, um, uh, who was who joined for part of our time together today, and um, uh, Mr. Emil Alzana, if you guys will just wave so they kind of know who you are, folks that, that have not met you yet. Mr. Emil Alzana, who is our Executive Director of Facilities. And then we also are privileged to have with us this evening, Ms. Jenna, uh, and is it Senda Jenna Wari? Is that correct? Okay, great. And uh, Jenna is uh, with Arch Environmental Trustees, and she is our consultant that oversees our testing process. And we appreciate all three of you being here this evening, and we'll invite you to the podium shortly uh, to respond to any questions that the trustees have. Uh, we always welcome uh, the opportunity to do our work better and testing for water quality is a process that we've been expanding and enhancing since the beginning in 2016. So I have just a few prepared remarks to try to cover the basic territory of this topic. And then uh, trustees, we look forward to your questions as we do at the table at our board meetings, at public meetings of the board is that you all are uh, prepared and will have questions. And our desired outcome is that we will take from this discussion uh, some action items and we're looking forward to continuing this work, engaging with our parents and concerned citizens and doing the work well and doing it right and completing it uh, over time. We're committed to achieving the lowest possible levels of lead in drinking water for our students and staff in the Ann Arbor Public Schools. And we take very seriously the risks associated with lead exposure, particularly for our youngest children and for all, uh, all of those in and out of our buildings. As a result, uh, trustees, you had a presentation back in May of 2016 uh, we have voluntarily tested water annually in all Ann Arbor Public Schools um, and buildings since the spring of 2016. I know that our board has partially turned over in the time since that initial beginning. So trustees, I shared with you some documents uh, last evening and also those testing results are posted um, as they have been on our website. Uh, since 2016, uh, we have addressed uh, issues um, of parts per billion measures of above 15 parts per billion established as an action level by the EPA and the MDEQ. Certainly, there is question about where that level should be, and that's a piece that you'll hear more about in just a few moments. Uh, testing for 2018 uh, water quality is scheduled uh, beginning uh, right away. That will be in October, November of 2018. Testing in Ann Arbor Public Schools is focused on high priority locations. So the locations in each building are the locations where students or staff are most likely to consume the water. So it would be drinking fountains, kitchen sinks, classroom water fixtures, those kinds of locations. We have increased the number of locations tested at each campus during this time. And that is significant because at our initial testing in 2016, we worked with the city of Ann Arbor and we're very grateful to them for their support. Uh, but we did in 2017 cover many more locations in each campus. Water testing is conducted by Arch Environmental Group, our professional partners to Ann Arbor Public Schools on environmental issues. Arch Environmental Group fulfills a similar service for 45 other school districts across Michigan. 
the AAPS protocol for addressing the issue when lead levels read at or above 15 parts per billion includes flushing and retesting at the location, replacing water fixtures, and in some cases, replacing the pipes behind the water fixtures if that is a part of the issue. So this is the protocol that has been recommended to us by uh, water quality experts in the field. And as per the protocol, we have over these two years addressed all locations with the 15 parts per billion or greater. In addition to that work, so the first leg of the stool is the testing. In addition to that work, uh, we've been busy also with replacement of older water fixtures. And as our buildings average 65 years of age, um, this is an activity that we are very engaged in. It's an activity that we will need to continue work in. So we've been busy replacing water fixtures with the new uh, water bottle filling stations and watering uh, hydration stations, whatever the word is you prefer on that, um, in order to work through the process of getting some of our oldest fixtures out of the building. Uh, trustees, we have a few proposed next steps uh, in this process. As I shared with Dr. Dumas today, this is a particularly good time for this conversation as we enter uh, the two months of testing coming up. And uh, so we have a few recommendations. One is uh, I've asked Mr. Lautzana, Assistant Superintendent Mr. Dimitriou, to uh, install water bottle filling stations in all of our Ann Arbor public schools, a project which can be accomplished fairly quickly. And this would give us the opportunity, while we are working through a number of older buildings, to educate and to have these filling stations, these hydration stations, as a preferred location or locations within the building for water consumption. Secondly, we will continue the flushing of all water systems. This is especially important. And you recall, trustees, those of you who were at the May 2016 presentation that Brian Steglitz with uh, Ann Arbor City um, team advised us, and it, I may be misremembering, but I think this was correct, that when we return from vacation, even in our homes, we should run the water one minute for every day that we've been gone on vacation. And the same is true with schools. So uh, Mr. Emil Lautzana has overseen this process, but I wanna reassure the trustees and the community that we continue to uh, conduct this process in ensuring that following summer, Thanksgiving, winter break, or spring break, that we are doubling down on the flushing through uh, the pipes. Thirdly, with the fall 2018 water testing, we would like to increase the number of locations tested in each school. As, as has been noted this evening, we are not testing every location in a school. In an elementary school, that could be as many as 40 locations. Uh, we have been testing, or we did uh, last year, somewhere around a dozen, depending on the school. Uh, so we would like to bring forward a proposal, trustees, to test more, uh, an increased number of locations, particularly in our older buildings, uh, two examples uh, we've discussed would be Ann Arbor Open, uh, one of our buildings that will celebrate its 100th birthday uh, in the near future, along with uh, Burns Park. Um, and we have other buildings where we would especially prioritize more locations being tested. Fourthly, we would like to lower the threshold for implementing the protocol of flushing and retesting and repairs, if necessary, that will be implemented from 15 parts per billion to 10 parts per billion. 
I do acknowledge that that, that does not meet uh, the request for five parts per billion, uh, but we do believe that it shows and demonstrates progress in this work. Increasing uh, the number of locations uh, will uh, double down our work to ensure that as many locations as possible are tested. And I know that our professionals in this area will speak to this shortly, uh, but there is, and you'll remember Mr. Seglitz also shared this, there is uh, a strategic uh, uh, approach to the testing to ensure that those areas of concern are always tested. Fifth step, we would like to, as, um, as Ms. Senda suggested in one of the communications trustees that afforded you last night, that we install signage throughout our buildings in low priority locations. So in areas such as the custodial closet or um, an exterior faucet on a building that's designed uh, maybe for watering in those kinds of low priority locations that we would install signage that would clarify and remind everyone that the water in those locations is not for personal consumption. Um, and by in doing that, to really focus on those areas where we know that students and staff are most likely to be consuming water. Finally, trustees, uh, as was noted earlier, uh, we had the professionals and did this presentation following our testing cycle in 2016. I would be my recommendation this evening that we resume that work. Uh, the board has been um, briefed on these matters, but there is something special, as we know, about an annual um, open uh, demonstration and presentation and discussion of this data. So we would recommend going forward that this be a part of our annual calendar, along with the many other presentations that you all have uh, throughout the year. I wanna be clear, and then I'm gonna ask Mr. Um, Demetrio, Mr. Lautzana, and Ms. Senda to come to uh, the podium. Uh, I'd like you to give uh, some follow-up remarks uh, and clarifications. I wanna be clear that I speak to this topic as a layperson, do not remotely uh, pretend to have expertise, but we do have an incredible team on this, and uh, we are deeply committed to the work and to getting it done right for our children. In the Ann Arbor Public Schools, we are committed to the work of preventing and addressing levels of lead in school drinking water. And we look forward to maintaining our position as a leading school district in Michigan on this very critical issue of student health and safety. I won't belabor the point uh, that we are doing more by reporting our data because that's how we operate. Uh, so we won't go through that. And yet trustees, you know, as well as I do, that there are very few districts in the state that, that post that data. So we are proud uh, to be transparent about it. We are the first folks who take a long look in the mirror and know that there are improvements that we can make and we will make them straight away. And so with that, Mr. Demetrio, Mr. Lautzana, and Ms. Senda, will you come and add your professional remarks um, and then we'll turn it back to Madam President for the board's discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swift, for that uh, wonderful summary of our situation and our discussions and summarizing the uh, preliminary recommendations to the board for uh, carrying this program forward. Um, having previously been uh, at Detroit Public Schools when uh, the Flint crisis became public and there was a lot of attention on that um, and participated in on the team that proactively tested in Detroit and many of the actions that were taken there. Um, I was impressed by the plan that ARC Environmental had implemented here in Ann Arbor Public Schools. I think it's a, a good plan with, a, with a, a trajectory for more and more action as we discover more information. Um, and, and I welcome questions and thoughts from the board, and we're here to respond as, as best we can. I wonder, before we turn it to the board, if we could go ahead, Ms. Senda, and cover the 
the issues with the readings that caused concern. Uh, you explain that very beautifully and very technically, and I think the board would appreciate having your explanation and members of the Absolutely. community as well. I want to thank you for having me here. Um, before I start, I do want to let you know that I also am a uh, parent of two school children that are in Ann Arbor Public Schools, so I am invested in this. Um, we conducted sampling over the summer break in 2017, which is not ideal and not necessarily recommended, but based on some resources that we had, it was a time frame that we had to kind of commit to, and many other districts at this time had to do with the same, same thing. Part of the MDEQ protocol talks about if you have stagnancy because of long breaks or and you're going to be testing that they recommend flushing the day before mm -hmm. um, we did work with custodial staff to identify the locations we were going to sample and to make sure that they were flushed the day before but that they still met the 8 to 24 hours of stagnancy before we collected our first draw things happen and sometimes things didn't get flushed exactly how we wanted them to and this is how they've already been sitting it was uh, end of july so they had been sitting at least a month um so when we got the high results from the initial ones we wanted to make sure that it was a representative sample meaning it wasn't stagnant and it had been sitting since the end of uh school or since um you know possibly before then so we would go back at the end of a of a work day and we would take a flush sample. Now we would either collect a 30 second flush if it was a bubbler or fixture or 15 minute flush if it's a cooler, which is recommended by the EPA. We then would flush the location for two more minutes to verify that it was flushed and we would come back the next morning after eight to 24 hours to make sure that we collected another first draw. So essentially we called it a repeat first draw. The majority of those came back significantly lower, sometimes lower than um, five, some lower than 15. If they came back significantly lower, it was an indicator that it was a stagnancy issue and not a representative sample. So that's kind of where we moved with that um, because of the summertime. We, have, we will not be doing sampling after a period of stagnancy because it creates these kind of problems. Um, it was just a situation we found that we needed to do it at that time. So will you highlight the Burns Park example mm -hmm. uh, for the trustees? They've heard about it, but just the, the 320 parts. So mm -hmm. in my experience, I've been doing this since 2003, since we started, since I started with Arch Environmental. It is, it, some locations, when they are stagnant for periods of time, can have high results we have seen this in many districts where it's one location it's been stagnant um, possibly uh, it was stagnant before school ended um, that one is in room three or four it is possible that it never gets used in that classroom oftentimes when we do see this we do recommend at the time that this be a location that needs to be flushed more often weekly recommended that teachers in the classroom know that they need to flush it daily. So we do make that recommendation. It, it, it can all depend on what kind of classrooms in there. We do, try to notif we do try to identify those classrooms if they are not used as often or it's more of a storage area. Um, sometimes the special needs classrooms that aren't used constantly throughout the day are not used. So that's an example of what can happen. Um, and when we retested, you can see that when we did the flush, it came down to 10. Now that's a 30 second flush. I flushed it for 30 seconds and it came down to 10. And then when we came back the next day, it was five, which really shows that it was likely a stagnancy problem. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you replace fixtures, it doesn't always make things better. It can make things just slightly more difficult. So we try to make sure we're doing the right thing, replacing the right items. And we also do an inventory of the fixture to see if there's, um, if there's lead, if there's copper with lead solder. So we do look at all that when we do our flush sample. 
Thank you. I You're guess welcome. the other piece I think the trustees would want to know before jumping in, Mr. Laudzana, is we talked today about the cost of um, replacing and putting in the water filling stations, the hydration stations. Would you just review quickly for the trustees? And this would be sinking fundable, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, the the cost for the for the the actual physical water bottle filling station with a lead filtration a filter built into it uh, is somewhere between 750 to 900 dollars for the unit the installation cost um, with the plumbing the provision of electrical which often isn't there the replacement of potentially some of the piping associated potentially repair of the wall surface um, the installation can cost between three to four thousand dollars so an all-in cost per water bottle filling station of approximately thirty seven hundred to forty seven hundred five thousand dollars give or take um, the, the filters that are associated with this are to be replaced depending on the brand and the filter type approximately every three thousand gallons or at a minimum once per year and those filters cost about sixty sixty five dollars if you buy them in quantity and then the um the water bottle filling station also serves as a water fountain i intended for us to have a photo tonight to yeah. show the trustees and i bet we can pull yeah. one up but it also works as a water fountain for those students who don't ever remember their water bottle yes yes the kind that we've been putting in our, our dual function okay. so they have the and i think most people have seen them they have the counter and it says how many gallons of water and plastic bottles you've saved and all that oh. and then there's the the place to put the bottle and there's also the the sort of the regular drinking fountain very good but the the lead filtration goes to no matter which source whether you want to fill your Correct. bottle or drink out of the fountain Correct. it's has the same effect okay. Correct. thank you uh trustees madam president i believe that provides our summary this team will continue some critical thinking uh processes in decision making processes we will invite uh, the input and the feedback of uh, folks who are interested in this topic secondly we will communicate as trustee kelly pointed out with our parents we wanted to have this discussion this evening um, although our principals have received an initial communication today uh, because we wanted to get something out straight away and then thirdly, if it uh, meets uh, the will of the board, we'd like to come back to the board on October 10th uh, with a, a revised plan, uh, including these kinds of areas. But uh, we need to do some work on the numbers behind adjusting the plan. And it's not that we don't want to spend money, so may, please don't mistake what I'm saying. But um, every uh, several thousand that we spend on testing is that much money that we don't have for a new water fixture. So I think the critical thinking process will help us to ensure that we're doing excellent testing, but we're also doing uh, replacement and immediate replacement in some areas where we have concern. So let us uh, do uh, some work and uh, if it meets the Willow Board return on October 10th, which is our next board meeting with a plan in place, that will give us October and November still to accomplish our testing. Um, does that sound does that sound okay? Yeah, the only thing I would add is don't don't wait for us. If yes. there's signage we can put up on mm -hmm. water sources that we know aren't really intended for drinking, um, just as a you know, one of those other reminders to encourage folks to go to a drinking fountain or a water filling. We do have water filling stations in several of our schools. All of our high schools have at least one. They do. Um, and several of our middle schools, this one does, I know. Burns Park has two. Yeah, and Burns Park. Mm -hmm. so, so we do have some capability of directing folks already to better sources. <laughs> so don't wait for the 10th. You know, like don't let I us be your, um, your rate limiting step. Very good. So trustees are okay with the six steps. We would move forward on those immediately, um, including directing the replacement of some locations right away, as this team has noted. 
This is a good discussion. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for the parents and community members that came. Um, you don't have to leave. We have more exciting stuff coming up.